In this video, we are going to make a really powerful system to make fully procedural top stitches on the edge of your meshes. You just have to select your vertex group and have clean UV unwrap and in a single click, you can have really clean top stitches that are fully stable in any animation workflow. With a bunch of parameters, you can get the look you want and it also creates a bunch of shader attributes to get really intricate detail even on a low poly mesh and at no performance costs. This is a cleaned up version of a setup I have been using for the past year on several client projects with great success and it is also the first part of a bigger toolbox for procedural work with cloth assets with one click hem all kind of top stitches between different pieces of fabric, embroidery details and everything being entirely stable with any animation pipeline, whether it is shape keys, deform modifiers, cloth simulation or even alambic caches, along with an animation system for beautiful stitch animations in your product showcase. Everything will be available on my Gumroad and if you purchase this asset pack right now, everything else in this toolbox will be available for free even when we will reach the final version of this toolbox, which will be more expensive. The method we are going to use to make the most stable system for animation is to work almost entirely in UV space, because this is really a clean space that will never be deformed, whatever your animation will be. Then we will select vertex group wherever you want, convert them to curves so we can slide them along the surface and place them wherever we want with a few parameters, do a bit of math to convert this to really clean top stitches geometry and finally create a bunch of shader attributes to add as many details as you want. So let's get to it. Let's start by modeling a few objects on which to test the setup. So here are my test objects. I have a kind of belt with a simple rollover end and a buckle at the middle. It also have a rounded end to make some tests. Then I have a kind of bag flap with a rounded hole in the middle. The same one with a square hole, some sort of handle end with a square end and an interesting shape in the middle and a really strange concave shape to test some things further. On all of them I simply put a solidify modifier and to test some more interesting deformation, I added some deform modifiers before all the solidify modifiers. So I have here a curve deform modifier on the belt, a simple deformed on the back flaps and the handle and some displaced texture with a cloth texture on the strange piece. Now before moving on, we need to make sure the UVs are properly unwrapped on each piece and we also need to set up our islands properly. So go to the UV editing tab. On this one, we simply need to add a seam on this piece because it's a loop. So press U and mark seam. Then you can just select everything, U and unwrap. Here we need to make sure we have a really small margin because we don't want to have a margin of zero, which will cause issues later. For the other pieces, it's pretty straightforward. We need to do a simple unwrap. And now we can add back all the deformed modifiers. Now to prevent issues later, on the belt we also need to make sure that where our edge loop on the belt we also need to make sure that where we put our UV seam, the mesh is separated. At the moment, the mesh here is a single loop, so we can select our seam and under vertex we can hit rip vertices. That way the part is separated right here and it will prevent a bunch of issues later. Now we can add some vertex groups on each of the pieces to select where we want our top stitches. Here I will just rename all of them edges and in edit mode I will select some edge loops with alt shift click like this. And I just assign a value of 1. Let's do the same on all pieces. Now we can finally add back all the deform modifiers and move on to the geometry nodes tab. Here on one of the objects, we can add a new geometry node setup, which I'm going to call group to top stitches. Now I can put this modifier 
right between the deform modifier and the solidify modifier and I can add it on all of the objects. And make sure the geometry setup is already placed between the deformation you are making, whether it is an alumbing cache or anything else, and the other mesh operations like solidify, subdivision surface, and so on. For stability, everything we are going to compute will be in the UV space. So the first step is to put our mesh into its UV space. We can add the set position node and put the position as a new input, which we can rename UV map. Right here in the modifier settings, you can input the attribute toggle and select the UV map, which you can do for all of your test objects. And now you should see all your objects without the deform modifiers applied. Then a second step of the setup is to select only the edges we set before in the vertex group. So you can add a separate geometry node and input the selection as a new input. Here we can also set the attribute toggle and select all our edges. For now, everything is duplicated because the solidify modifier still applies to this, but we'll clean that up in a moment. For now, I just need to clean this part on this mesh. We have a full triangle selected, which will prevent us to have a nice selection. Here I can just use the knife tool to add some edge loops like this and make sure it is not selected by hitting remove. Now the end of this triangle is cleaner. Now to prevent everything from being duplicated and because we only work with curve, we can add a mesh to curve node. And these four nodes are the basis of our setup, which we can frame with Ctrl J. Then let's right away set up the output of the group so we can move back into the world's coordinates and merge the curve that we will edit with the base geometry. So we can add a group input. And here we need to sample the UV surface the UV map will be the source UV map. We can set it to vector and sample the position like this. Now we can add a set position node, put the value into the position, and right after it, we can add the joint geometry node and also put back our source geometry like this. Now we should see our source geometry with a black line on the edges, which is our new curves. Let's frame this in two different blocks like this. And now let's try to offset those curves. Let's add a set position node. Here we can add a vector math node set to scale because we will scale some vector by an input value to get our deformation. We can plug this into the offset input of the set position node and let's add a group input and put the scale as a new input. This one will be the edge distance. We can set its subtype to distance and it will be a single value. For the direction along which we want to slide everything, we need at each point of the curve to have a direction which is perpendicular to the curve itself. As of now, the only direction we are sure of is the tangent of the curve, which is this way. So we need to find a way to flip it 90 degrees, which will be quite hard to do consistently in three dimensions, but luckily we are still working in UV space so we are sure there is absolutely zero Z component, so we can just rotate our tangent along the Z axis. And to do that, the cleanest way to do this with proper vector math is to compute the cross product of our curve tangent with a Z vector, so make sure we have only one on the Z value, and input this as the scale of our vector. So this we can frame, and it will be the core of our slide edges. Now, if you test this with a smaller edge distance, you should see things starting to happen. The behavior is promising, but not everything is consistent. We have two different directions that are happening on one piece. The center part needs a positive edge distance value and the outer part a negative one, and it is the same on the other pieces. We also have some issues where there are overlaps which will clean up in just a moment. Now the change in direction is basically due to the fact that we can't really predict the direction the curve will have when Blender converts a mesh to a curve. So some might have all their tangent vector pointing in one direction 
but some in the other. And when we are computing the cross product, they might not end up in the same direction. We could fix this problem a bunch of different ways, which would involve a lot of math. So that would be quite clean, but it would be really hard to implement. So to fix this issue, I propose a much simpler solution, which is simply to try to move the edges just a little bit. And we'll see if we are outside of the mesh, then we need to reverse its direction. So that will ensure all our sliding edges are still in the inside of our mesh. So to do that, right before our slide edge group, we can add a reverse curve node, and now we need to select the input. As I said, we want to try to move some points, so for that we can use a sample curve node, because it will right away give us the tangent, position and everything. Now for a random value, we can select the factor to 0.5, so we always select the middle point of our curves. And to make sure each curve is selecting a single point along itself, we need to make sure each curve is aware of its curve index. We can add the capture attribute node right here, set to integer and spline, and we can sample the index. That way, if we have a look, each spline is aware of its index. And now we can plug the output of the capture attribute as the curve index. Now let's have a look. And we have two different position values. So we have one single value for each curve. Now, just like before, we can take the tangent and compute the cross product with the D value. To try to offset, we can add a really small value. So again, we can add a vector mass scale node. And here, instead of putting a random, really small value, we can just take our group input and put the edge distance, let's say divided by 100, into the scale. So that way, we'll try to offset the edge loops by 100 of the real distance in some direction, and we'll check if we are already outside or inside of the mesh. So now we can add this offsetted value to the position which we sampled. And now the easiest way to check if we are on the mesh or not is because we are still in UV space, we can use the sample UV surface node, which has a is valid output, which basically tells us if the point we are trying to sample is on the UV island or not. So we can add a group input, put the geometry as the mesh, set this to vector because we want to sample this value. And as before, the source UV map will be our UV map from the input. Now let's make a bit more room. This value we need to evaluate on the domain of the spline. So we have a single value for each spline. And here we want to reverse the curve if this value is not valid. So we can put this into a boolean math node operation and plug that into the reverse curve. And now if we take a look at our objects with and without this operation, now whatever the edge distance value is, all our offset curves will still be on our meshes, which is a really nice and simple fix. So here I'm just removing all the minus signs, so it's a bit cleaner in my mind. And it looks nice for now. Let's frame all this. So this will be fixed curve direction. Now let's do a first step of cleanup right after our slide edges group. We can move this over. And now the goal will be to remove the kind of squiggle we get when the edges are offset near an angle. To do this, we need to remove some points. So we can add a delete geometry node. And to select which points we will need to remove, we simply need for each point to check its distance with the closest points of the original spline, which is on the outside. And if this is less than the value we want to move, then we can just delete this point. So our original curve is stored right here. So we can add a reroot node and we can use a sample nearest node so that each point of this new curve will sample a value on this curve. Now the sample nearest node for some reason doesn't work with curves, so we need to add a curve to mesh node right here. And now as usual with the sample nearest node, we need to couple it with a sample index node, like this. Here what we want to sample is a vector, which is the position, and to check the distance between the points on, this, on the new curve and the old one, we simply need to check the vector math distance between this sampled value and the original position, like this. Now we can check if this value 
is less than some value and you guessed it the value with which we want to test the distance is our edge distance now to add a bit more wiggle room if needed we can add a new math operation right in between set to multiply and we can put a value close to one like 0.99 this we can also set as a new input which will be a single value set to factor between 0 and 1 and we can rename it cleanup threshold now if you enable or delete geometry node all the strange points should have been removed like this so it seems to be working really nice which is even more visible if we crank up the distance by a big amount now let, let's clean this up just a bit so you can select all this and frame it with ctrl j and let's rename this cleanup now another cleanup step we can do right away is if you see here on this belt there is a point which isn't moving back into its original space and this is because for some reason its uv space is no longer valid so it doesn't have any new points to compute in its original space we can simply choose to remove this one so we can add a delete geometry node and for the selection we can simply check if the uv we are trying to move back is no longer valid so again with the boolean math not operation we can set it right here and we removed this second artifact now the next thing we can do is to add a bit more precision to everything so as you see here we don't have much points which we are moving and this caused even more problem because we are removing some points if they are causing issues so we have some gaps in our computing so for this right after we fix the direction of the curve we can add a resampling group to improve the resolution so here we can add resample curve node and to compute this efficiently for the value we can just use the point count and for the count itself instead of putting an arbitrary value we can just set a value from the spline length node which gives us the point count of each curve which we can multiply by some value so let's say 10 this we can add as a new group input which we can call the resample precision which will be a factor with a minimum value of let's say 0.1 and this will also be a single value now we can set this in a new frame which will be resample also we can add another thing right before the mesh to curve we can add a subdivision surface node and we can set its default value to zero as a new input which we just name subdivision surface and make sure it is a single value now here on this rounded piece i want to add a bit of subdivision now here we can also set the input of our divide where we set it to 100 before as a new input which will be a single value with a minimum value of one and we can rename it curve reverse threshold because we may want to adjust this value for example on this one if we set it to 10 it works best with the subdivision another thing we need to do is to fix the direction along which the points are slided for example the real value along which we want to move each point is really dependent on the starting geometry here this point because it is starting on a flat line is moving the right value but this one should actually be a bit further away like this so this value will be longer than the original value it's the same in the other direction if we have a really steep angle we also want the actual value to be a bit longer so this will be easy to compute if you look at your angle like this and this point is moving along this value and this point instead of moving the same amount should be moving to be along the same position so its distance should be this long and to compute this it's a simple right angle triangle for which we know this angle and so this new value will simply be our original distance divided by the sine of the angle divided by 2 so we already know this distance but we need to know the angle of the edges of our starting point let's compute this right after the resample block to know the angle for example of these points we need to know the position of its two neighbors and compute the angle between them so first we need to get the position of the two neighbors of each point which we can get with some sample index nodes 
we'll need two of them for the two neighbors and we'll be willing to sample the position, which is a vector. For the index, we simply take the index plus one for the next neighbor and the index minus one for the previous one. So this will give us the absolute position of the two points and the position right here is just the position of our starting point. So we can compute the two vectors I showed earlier with some simple subtract operation in vector math. So we subtract our original position to the sampled one we just sampled, like this. Now that we have these two vectors, to get the angle, it's quite easy. If we have two normalized vectors, the angle is simply the arc cosine of the dot product. So we can compute the dot product of those two vectors and get the arc cosine. So for each point, this will give us the angle between its two neighbors. If we are checking the angle of a point which is in the end, it only has one neighbor. So for this, we simply say that its angle is zero. So we can select those points with an endpoint selection with a start and end size set to one. And this will go into a switch node set to float. And right here, instead of switching between the angle values, if we take the formula from before, we'll simply switch between the sign of the angle and one. So we only have either this whole function or the original distance. So if we are on the endpoints, we need a value of one. And if we are not, we need to divide our alpha value by two, take the sign and put this right here. Now we can plug this in between our edge distance and the scale vector node from before. So we can add a divide math operation and we need to divide our edge distance by the value we just computed, which we can plug into our scale node. Now if we take a look at this with a high enough resample precision, so on this piece instead of 10, I'm going, to, I'm going for 100. And if we see the effect with and without this divide operation, the result is pretty clear on those edges. It's the same for this piece, where before everything was way smoother and would be really ugly on the edges. So now let's also set this with a switch node if we want to deactivate this feature in some cases. So here we can just add a switch node set to float right before the scale operation and you can switch between the value we just computed and the original edge distance. And the switch value will set as a new input, as usual a single value. We can rename it improve corners. Now on all this one, I will simply hit it with alt click. Now we just need to clean this up a bit. And we can frame everything here. And this will just be fixed corner distance. Now let's finally move on to modeling the final stitches. For that, we need to duplicate our curves at the bottom of the solidify modifier, resample it so we have regularly spaced points, and then shuffle some points so we can have some oscillating stitches, either in saddle mode like this, or in cross stitch, which will look more like this. So right here at the end, we need to duplicate the branches. For this, we can just select our set position node. With Alt P, we can remove it from the frame and Control Shift D duplicate to have a copy of this. Now we'll add the joint geometry node right here. And here we need to compute some offset values. So we have duplicates on each side of our mesh. The offset we'll compute will depend on the normal of the mesh right after the set position operation. So for that, we can duplicate the two set position nodes like this, and we'll start working on the offset values. Because we want to slide along the normals, we need to know for each point of our curve the normal of the closest surface point of our original mesh. So we can take our original mesh with the group input and add a sample nearest surface node. For the value we can set to vector because we want the normal. And this value we can simply scale by some amount to get the offset. 
Now right away, we can set the scale as a new input, which will simply be the material thickness, which will be a single value set to distance. And here in our modifier, we can simply copy and paste the thickness we set to our solidify modifier. Right now it is being duplicated on top of our mesh. So we also need to multiply this by minus one. And now let's correct the distances on all of our test objects. Like this. So it seems to be working really well. We have our duplicated curve lines on each side of our objects. Now it might also be time to add another offset so we can set our stitch a bit above or below the surface. So right here we can duplicate our scale node, put it as the offset of the other branch and for the value we can set a new input which will be the surface set. Again we can set a single value and subtype distance. And on the second one we can simply add it to the material thickness. Now let's select all our objects and for now let's set this value to zero. But as you can see it is working well to offset everything. Now let's join this block in a frame which is going to be the surface offset. Now to offset the points and make the stitches we first need to resample our curves so that the points are regularly spaced as we want and will correlate to the distance at which we want our stitches. So right after our UV sampling group we can add a resample curve node and to compute its value we need to have a group input and we need to add two new inputs. The first one will be a float subtype distance single value with a minimum value of zero and it will be the stitch step size. Then the other one will be an integer minimum value of zero single value and it will be the stitch resolution with the minimum value of one and let's say a default value of three. Let's just put this to all our objects. Now the easiest thing to do will be to just resample everything by length using the stitch step size. But this will cause some issue as we are computing everything after the deformation and the deformation might change the length of the curve. But fortunately we are working in UV space where everything is fixed no matter what the deformation is. So right here we can capture an attribute which will be the length of each spline. So right here we can add the spline length node and put the length in this node. Now let's make a bit more room. Now with this attribute each curve will know its original length so we can divide that by our stitch step size which we can floor to get an integer and multiply by the stitch resolution to which we'll add one so we can get a fair number of points in any case. And this simply be a resample count. So as usual we can frame this block, resample stitch and for now let's just set a random value for the stitch step size to each of our curves. For example in my case the run one meter. Now that you have all this we can begin to switch points to get our saddle stitch which is the easiest case. So to switch some points before the joint geometry nodes of our two curves right here we need to add some set position nodes. And here for each curve we need to sample the points of the same index from the other curve. So we can add two reroutes node, set a sample index, set to vector, and this one will go on the bottom branch, this one on the top one, like this. Now we can set the sampled value as the position offset of the set position node, and here we want to sample the position, like this. For the index, we can just put the index just like so. Now with this we just completely swapped the two different curves so now we need to select which points we want to swap. So for the saddle stitch 
we need to have our group input so we can know the stitch resolution. We will need a compare operation with a greater than or equal value. So we'll be able to compare the value of some points with the resolution of the stitches. And the value we want to compare is the index from the spline parameter node. Now, as of now, the index will rapidly be way bigger than the stitch resolution. So we need to compute a modulo operation. We can just set a truncated modulo. And if we take a look at our saddle stitch, the whole pattern is two times the length of our original stitch. And because our stitch resolution is only on one side, we need to multiply this by two with the math operation before going into the truncated modulo. And if we plug this into our set position nodes, just like magic, we have some alternating stitches. And if I set it properly to multiply, like I said, instead of add, I can change the resolution as I want, as well as the step size to get everything properly. And you can already see the potential of everything. So this was the simple case of the saddle stitch. And let's right away push this a bit further to get our cross stitch. So if you take a look at our saddle stitch, we have our original points like this, and we simply swapped a few of them to get our stitch. For the cross stitch, we want to have something which would look like this. So for this, we need to add points at some places and compute a new offset value, which will be the middle of the two curves. So let's start by simply making the offset points go at the middle, which will be pretty easy to do. Right before position and in between the sample index nodes, we can add our sample value to our position and scale this by a value of 0.5 so we can average the two positions. We can do this on the two branches and instead of plugging it directly into the set position node, we can use a switch node set to vector so that the false input will be our new value, like this. And now as you can see, we already have something which is looking a bit more like a cross stitch. Here we can set the input of those new switch nodes as a new input, which will simply be to enable the saddle stitch, which we can also set to a single value, so we can switch between the two different modes like this. Then we also need to change which points we are switching. Instead of switching a bunch of points at some places, we need to switch only one point every few points, so we can add switch node set to boolean right here. Again, we can set our original branch to the true value and the switch mode as our new input from just before. And now to compute our value, we can again take our spline parameter, the index, again with a truncated modulo, but this time we'll just take our stitch resolution to which we'll add a two because right after that we'll add some points as I explained before, and to the index, I will add one. Now, instead of a greater than or equal, here we can just take the result of the equal check set to integer, and we want to check if this modulo is equal to zero. So now it's a bit hard to see the effect because it seems like it's just like before where we have a crossing, but in reality, we really have two Vs like this. And the final step of the cross stitch is to add some points. So when we are switching mode, the, the step size is still the same. So for this, right after our resample mode, let's make a bit more room. We can add a fillet curve, which will set to poly mode, so we can set how many points we want to add. You can already check limit radius and put a really, really small radius like this. Now, right now we are adding some points everywhere. So we want to set where we want to add the points. So for that, we can take our group input and the index from the spline parameter. Again, let's take the truncated modulo, this time with the stitch resolution. Here we want to check if it is equal in integer mode to zero. And if it is the case, we just want to switch between adding zero points or two, which we can plug into the count input of our fillet curve. Now let's add a switch geometry node to switch between this fillet curve node as the first input and the original flow as the true input. And this will, of course, be plugged into our saddle stitch boolean input. 
Now we can make a bit more room. So we can add this as the new frame as usual. This is a fillet curve. Now let's also group this from before, which is the switch selection and switch points. Now right at the end, in the end group, we may want to set the spline type to a nerves, which as you can see here, looks a bit better for the cross stitch. And let's also put this as the new input, which is going to be set nerves. And it is a single value. Also for the cross stitch to work properly, because we have some issues like right here, where it is looking really good on the outside in nerves mode, but on the inside it is reversed. The simple fix is to add a set spline cyclic node in the fillet curve group on the branch where we have our fillet curve and we simply toggle the spline off. Now it should be looking consistent everywhere. Now let's add a bit more detail to our stitches. If you look at real stitches, it is not always straight on like this. When looking from the top, we might have some really slight wiggle because when the two stitches are interlocking, they are pushing each other aside. So this we can do right before we are moving back into the world coordinates. We'll be able to add two set position nodes right here. And to offset the position, we first need to have a repeating value, which goes from minus one on one side of the stitch to zero in the middle and one on the other side. And this again and again, which we can do by taking our group input. As usual, we can take our spline parameter the index into a forward modulo, and this will go into a map range node. The output will be from minus one to one, as I explained. And now we need to compute the four max value and the value for the forward modulo. For the forward modulo, we can just take our stitch resolution, to which we'll add two, if the stitch is a cross stitch, which we can do like this. And now the max value for the map range will be our stitch resolution, minus one, if we are in saddle stitch, and plus one if we are in cross stitch. So just to add one, we can simply add our two value from before like this. And this will be the max value of our map range. Now, if I take a look at this, we should have alternating values, which seems to be the case, even though some black values are just negative values. Now for the side to side wiggle, we can just take this value, which goes from minus one to one, multiply it by some value, which we can take from the group input as a new input, which will be the stitch wiggle, again, a single value, and we can just set this to a distance. Now this value will simply scale a vector, which is as usual, or curve tangent, with cross product, with a vector which has only one on the Z value, like this. Now we can plug this into the two offsets from before, and make sure to set our stitch wiggle to a really, really small value everywhere. Now, as you can see, we have some really slight wiggle, but right now the wiggle is the same on the top and bottom. So here we just need to have two different scale values for the two different geometry flows. So we can just add a multiply operation with the value of minus one, which will go into the same scale node on the first branch. Now the two wiggle values are in the opposite direction which will look really nice. Let's clean this up a bit and add this as usual in a new group. Which will be our stitch wiggle. And now a final detail I want to add on the stitch itself is for the surface offset. I want to have a different value on the middle and the edges so that it doesn't look all flat and boring like right here if we are not in nerves mode and you can also smooth and row note everything. So with this new value which goes from minus one to one on each side, I instead want a value which goes from zero to one in the middle and back to zero on the side. So I can just take the output from the map range node, take the absolute value and subtract this to one. Perfect. Now with these values, which for now just goes from zero to one 
on each side, I want to have a smoother range. For this, we could do with the float curve, but I don't really like how we can control it from outside of the geometry node setup. Instead, we'll make a custom quadratic function, which will look like this. Here is the simple function, which I will really quickly implement. From the end to the beginning, as usual, we need to have one minus something, which is the output of a power operation. Let's put two. Here we need to take the output of an absolute, subtract node, which is something minus one, and the something is just our value. Now we can group this with Ctrl G, set the value as an input, the exponent as another input, and we can output the end value of the subtract operation. The second value, I will just rename it exponent. And this is our quadratic falloff function, which we can put right here and set it as a new group input, which will be, as usual, a single value set to factor this time, and it will be the stitch shape. And now the output of this quadratic falloff will be used to mix between two different values, which will be on the B input or surface offset from before in the surface offset node group. And on the A input, we need a new input, which we'll call inside offset. And this is a distance and a single value. Now if I plug this mix node and right here between our values from before, Let's just clean this up a bit and see if it is working properly. I will just put the stitch shape right before those two offset values. And now let's see how it looks. I will put a surface offset. So right, right here, we have the result from before with a, source, with a surface offset of zero which is really square. But if I increasing the surface offset and changing the inside offset, we have everything which is way smoother. And if we are increasing the resolution, we can also change the shape of this falloff. Let's just change the range of the stitch shape, which is just go from zero to 10, for example. And now we have a way finer control on the shape of everything. Although, here on the stitch wiggle, to the index, if we are not in saddle mode, we want to add 0.5. And now this is really it for the shape of the threads and everything. There are two steps left on this setup, which, are, which is first to generate some geometry along those curves, and second to fix the shading, and second to fix the shading near those curves. So let's add some geometry. So we will do this in a second geometry node setup so that we can really separate the steps and do this after the solidify modifier and other geometry modifying modifiers we will use. So to discriminate between this and to add a capture attribute node right after the set spline type and right before the join geometry node at the end, set to boolean, we can hit true and we can set this as a group output, which will be the thread attribute. Also, because we may want to select the two different stitches independently, so, so that the top one and bottom one, whether it is in the shader mode or elsewhere, we can also add a capture attribute node on the second branch of the, of the stitches right here before we are joining the two curves together. And we can set this to integer with a value of one. Now we can output this attribute right here and rename it thread index. Here I will also put default attribute. So for the thread attribute, I just want to type thread. And for the thread index, we have thread underscore index. So both those attributes, we can set the domain to spline. And it's the same on the outside values. This will make sure it doesn't take too much place in the memory. Now I'm just putting back all those values in the setups. And let's add a geometry setup after everything else. This will be stitch curve 
two mesh. So right here, in our node group, the first step is to separate the geometry. And for the selection, we need an attribute, which will be our thread from before. This we can rename the thread attribute and set the default attribute to thread. Now at the end, we want to join this back with the original geometry like this. But before that, we want to add a curve to mesh node and with profile curve, we need a curve circle. Now we can already set the resolution and radiuses as new inputs. I just lower the default value and the radius 2.001 meter like this. Now if you want to keep the shading of our original geometry, we need to set it as the first input of the joint geometry at the end. And now let's add some other attributes. First right now the curve is always in the same direction. So I want to add some twists. We can add the set curve tilt node right before we set the curve to mesh. And this value we need to change all along the curve. And to that we also need another attribute from our geometry node group from before which is the spline length we captured in the attribute when we resampled everything. So this attribute, which we can set to spline, we can just output right at the end with a really long line. So this will give us a really stable length distance because it has been captured in the UV space. We can set it as a length attribute and set the default to thread underscore length. The subtype will be a distance. Now back in our stitch curve to mesh, we can add a new input, which is the length attribute, subtype distance, and right here we can set our thread length, which will also be the default attribute. Let's also make sure we set it before. And now if we take the spline parameter factor, multiply it by this value, we'll have an always different but stable value for each point on along our spline. Now we can take this and multiply it by some value, for our twisting speed, which we can set as an input, which will be the twist speed. And this will be a single value. Now, if I put this value way high, you can see its effect really clearly. As you can see here. Now, in order to be able to properly shade this right after, we need to store some attributes to basically get a clean UV space for each thread. So for that, we need a capture attribute node right before the join geometry node which will be set to vector and the domain will be the face corner. We can output this as the thread UV, the default attribute of UV thread like this and set the attribute domain to face corner. Now for the value, we can add the combine XYZ node and we need to store some values depending on the radius of the curve and the position of each point along the line. We already got the position which we can capture right here as a float value because it is the output of the factor multiplied by the length attribute. And this will be set as the x input. And for the y input, we can capture the length for the curve circle. Just like this. And finally, we also need to set a material to the threads. So we can have a set material node with the material as a new input. And this is all we need to do and apply this to all our test objects. So all our geometry will be appearing right here. Now by playing along with the parameters, we can get a bunch of interesting results. And before moving on to the texture, I just want to change some parameters so that we can stack those node groups. To do that, we would just need to pipe in the values from the previous modifier we'll add to the new one. So we need to add three new attributes, which correspond to the three outputs attribute we have here, so that we can pipe everything into a single stitch to curve mesh node group. Really quickly, we can just add some reroute node on the three lines right here, plug the new inputs node to the outputs from before like this. And now we just need to add some math Add operation in between each line. Just like that. And now if we test this, so if I duplicate this group, 
with a different edge distance and on the second group I set my attributes to the output from the previous one it works perfectly and now I can stack them as many as I want I can also put them on different edge groups so for example I had a second edge group where I will just select some random edges like this and I can add a third group where I set my edges bits and it also works perfectly now I just need to make sure my default attribute have the same name now with this new test edge loop we may also want to trim the edges so let's add a trim curve node into a resample stitch node group and let's set it to work with length here I will add some new inputs the trim start and for the trim end we just need to take our capture attribute for the length and subtract our end value like this now you can rename them trim start and trim end just to make it easier we can set them as single values give them a distance I'll just put them above our three attributes from before and I want the default value of both to be zero now right here I am resetting all the trimming except on the group with my edges bit where I can slightly trim off the edges right now it is squashing everything so we also need to subtract those two values from this flow line right after we capture this attribute so we can take this right here and also subtract the trim start value and now whatever trim value we choose everything should be computed correctly for the texturing we are going to create a new kind of uv map in a different space which we store for each point on our mesh some data corresponding to the closest point on our spline we are going to store the position of the point along our spline so that will give us a gradient all along our mesh and for each point on our mesh we are also going to store the distance between the closest point on our mesh projected along the vector perpendicular to the spline and the distance projected along the tangent of our curve this will allow us to create a bunch of different gradients that will radiate outward from our curves and also have a different value all along our mesh line which will also enable us to create points at each point where our stitch is going into the material create seam puckering and everything else to do that we are going to store some attributes on our mesh right before the end where we are merging it with our curves so we can duplicate the group input and put it back right here now we are going to store some data in the UV space before putting back our object into the world coordinates so we can add a two set position node the first will allow us to go into the UV space when we are plugging in the UV map and the second with a sample index node set to vector will allow us to go back to the world coordinates when we are sampling the position of the original points like this now in between that we'll capture some attributes which is going to be a vector in the face corner domain and that will correspond to the uv map we are going to create right away we can put this as a new output which is going to be the uv proximity with the default attribute of uv proximity like this now we need to compute the values of this vector so we can add the combine xyz node a bit to the left this we can join in a frame and to compute this data we we'll need our curve right before we are resampling it but right after we are computing the attributes so it is at this point after the trim curve node we just added so we add this somewhere with the reroute node so we can get it closer to my combined XYZ node. So first we need to resample this curve to add some geometry and eventually improve the precision of our proximity attributes. Just like we did before, we can set this at the output of a multiply node between the spline length, point count, and a new input of the group input, which is going to be a single value and it will be UV proximity precision which we set as a factor with a minimum value of 0 and a default value of 10 this will also be a single value 
Now with this resampled curve, we are going to capture two attributes, which is first a vector, which is the curve tangent, and the second one, which will be a float value. And for this float value, we basically need to have a value which reaches a multiple of one at each point between the seams. Now for that, we need first the number of points from the resample curve in the resample stitch group, to which we are subtracting one because we want the number of intervals and not the number of points. Then we need the spline parameter, the factor, and multiply this by the, the subtracted value. This we can now divide by the stitch resolution and also offset this by a value of 0.5 because the first stitch is only half made. Then you can put this into our capture attribute and there is also another subtlety because we are taking the factor to compute some value when we are in a cyclic curve the value will grow from 0 to 1 all around it but then at the end we have a value of 1 really near a value of 0 and in the UV space this will be interpolated poorly with a really steep slope and the easiest way to prevent that is just to have a math ping pong operator with a scale of 0.5 so the value will grow from 0 to 1 at the middle and back to 0 again so everything will be really smooth and we only want this to be applied when the curve is cyclic so we can plug the switch input into a east spline cyclic node like this now that we've stored those attributes at the level of our curves we need to transfer them to our mesh now remember this combined XYZ node is applied at the UV level of our mesh. So to fetch those data from this curve, we need to use some sampled nearest node. And just like before, it doesn't work on curve, so we need to convert it to a mesh. Then we can plug the sample nearest node. And here we are going to want to sample three different values, which are going to be a float value. This is the second attribute we made, Control shift d a vector value, which is a curve tangent, and Control shift d a second vector, which is going to be just the position of the points. Now right away, we can plug our sampled float value into the input of the combined XYZ node into the Z value, and to plug those two other values into the X and Y input, we need to do a bit of math. As I said before, we want to know the position of the points projected along the tangent of the curve. To do a projection, a bunch of different operators in Blender, but in our case, as the normal tangent are already normalized, we can just use some vector math set to dot product, and this will give us the same result in the case of normalized vectors, which we can plug in the x and y inputs. Now here we want to project one vector onto the tangent, like this, so we can plug in the output of the sample of the tangent and the other will be perpendicular so again we can use our cross product trick with the value on the z-axis as the target of the projection and now the values we are going to project is just the difference of position between our point in our mesh and the closest point on our mesh line so we can add a subtract operator and just subtract the position like so now we can frame this which is going to be our UV proximity computing and it should already work perfectly. So let's go to the shading tab and test this out. I'm going to set this name to UV proximity. Now in order not to break everything when we are computing our UV attributes because we are moving in and out of the UV space we need to do this with a separate components node right here. So we are only computing this data on the meshes and then we can just join back our curves with a join geometry node like so. Now for the use of the shading attributes, I think it will be clearer if I just show you how I set it up in the demo scenes at the start of this video. So here I set up my belt with three geometry node modifiers to create the stitches. The first one creates the stitches on the outside of the main part, the second one gives the second layer of it, and the third one creates the additional details. 
Now all the attributes can be piped from one modifier to the other except the UV proximity. So here I had to create a new attribute for each of the modifier. So I have UV proximity, UV proximity bis, and UV proximity tear. And all the other modifiers are as usual. I have a solidify modifier, a symbol bevel modifier, subdivision surface, and finally the node group to convert the stitches to a mesh. Now into the shading tab. Here I am inputting all my three UV proximity maps and I am processing them with my top stitch proximity shader node group. And because I have three modifiers, I am stacking three node groups like this with the first three outputs plugged into the first three inputs. Now before I show you how I set them up, I show you how it works. So here I have a bunch of parameters and four different outputs. The first one creates circular gradients at each of the stitches meeting points. They should stop right where the stitches start, but you can change this distance if needed, and you can also offset the position of the gradients. Then we have a far proximity distance, for which we can change the distance, and this can be used to blend between colors, bumps, or so on, and we have a close proximity one to make some bump near the stitches, and this we can also change the distance. We also have the stitch step size as an input, because this will change the way we compute the distances. Now when we are stacking those groups, all the different attributes are just added onto another with maximum operations. In my case, I am using all the whole masks with some mapping to drive a bump node and blend between a, the original leather color and a darker version of it. I am doing the same with the far proximity to darken everything near the edges and also with the close proximity to add another layer of bump and darken everything and darken everything even more near the stitches, kind of fake ambient occlusion. Those three groups are doing the main computation. Here I also have some attributes to make some different shadings regarding my solidify modifier. And all this group right here is just my custom worn leather shader group, which is fully procedural for you to use. So here we have the base leather color and the darker version near the stitches. And also the last output of the node groups, which I am not using here, can be used to drive a noise texture, for example, to create some seam puckering along the edges. So this way you can have a noise texture properly flowing all around the, your stitches. Now let's finally have a look inside our node groups. So here I am inputting our UV map, which we made in the geometry node modifier, and I am splitting the different channels for my different computations. First to compute some fall-off distances between the stitches and our mesh, I am only selecting the X and Y channels because the Z value is a growing value all along our stitches and I am computing the length of it, which gives us a gradient in local space all around our stitches. This I can simply put into some map ranges with the input values I showed earlier and with the maximum operation I can stack them with the values from the previous modifier. And for the circular gradients at each stitch entry point, we'll be using the Z value, which with the ping pong operation set to 0.5, will give us some gradients which has the width of each stitches, along with our Y value, which is scaled by 1 over our stitch step size. We can combine this into a new vector, which will again be a kind of local UV space centered at each point entry space, and with the gradient texture, we can just get our different circles. Here I am using a minimum operation with our fall off from before, so we only get our circles when we are stitches and not on the sides. And then again, a maximum operation to pipe this with the previous values. And this is really it to get some really nice shading. And if I remove the leather bump and base color, we can really see all the details that this is adding. This is our base mesh. And this is it with our new bump maps. And here it is for this big tutorial. I hope you found it interesting and could learn a few things from here. As I said at the beginning, everything will be available on my Gumroad, and if you purchase it now, you will get free access to the full cloth toolbox that will eventually be released. Don't forget to like and subscribe to show your support, and see you next time.